Thanks very much. As a broker facilitator, I get the opportunity to interact with students on a regular basis, but it's even more of a pleasure to have met um, these wonderful student ambassadors who have had many interactions at the internship and fellowship and outreach level with NASA. Our first student to speak is Denise Aranda. She is a graduate of Florida International University. She has a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, and she is currently at a co-op with NASA Langley, and she's also pursuing her graduate studies in material science engineering um, at Virgin Virginia Tech. So Denise? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around. We're the NASA Student Ambassadors, and this is our story. Um, so as she mentioned, my name is Denise Aranda. Um, if you say it in Spanish, it's Denise Veronica Aranda, but I guess we're here is Denise Aranda. Either one works. Um, as she mentioned, I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Florida International University, which is in Miami, Florida. And I'm currently pursuing uh, my master's degree from Virginia Tech as a co-op through the NASA Langley Research Center. So I've always wanted to work for NASA. It's been a dream of mine for a while. So when I got the opportunity through the USRP, I joined Research Center in 2008. As you can tell, I just kept coming back for more and for more and for more. Um, I started off with the USRP, then I did the Space Academy at KSC, uh, Constellation Ground Ups at KSC, Ares 1X, then the Ambassador Program, Lars, and now the Co-op. Um, so one of the things that strikes me very interesting when people, strangers, meet me for the first time um, they see me and they see that I, I love my job and I have these degrees and I guess people assume that I, you, you're naturally born that way or, or you just always like that. But the truth is that my life could have turned out very different if I wouldn't have not had the mentors that I've had that led me up to this point. So I want to go in a little bit of a time travel with you guys. I want to backtrack 20 years um, where I was born, which is Caracas, Venezuela. And that was one of the pictures I was taking of me right before we left about 20 years ago. And as you can tell, I was a really cute baby. I'm not sure what happened since, but <laughs> maybe it was switching countries. Um, so my parents left Venezuela a few years before Chavez was there, and they had pursued their master's degree at University of Texas, and so they just thought that moving here would be a better opportunity for my sisters and I. Um, however, both of them being avid scuba divers and children of eternal sunshine, decided that the only place that we could live would be Florida, and moreover, Miami. So, bienvenidos a Miami. <laughs> Now, it is one of the most beautiful places in the world, however, the demographics, as you can see, are very different. It is the United States, but in a lot of ways, it's really not. Um, the Miami metropolitan area ranks seventh largest in the U.S., with 5.5 million people. And to put that into perspective, my high school, even this year, has 5,308 students, and that's just 9 through 12. So, to put that into even more perspective, there's more students in my high school than employers at Langley and that's civil servants and contractors combined. So it's a pretty, pretty largely dense populated area. Um, of those, about 70% are Hispanic or Latin, and 67% have Spanish as their first language. So even though it's paradise to live in, the school systems suffer a lot because of that. So you have very overcrowded classrooms, it's 50 students per teacher sometimes, and you have the added problem of the language barrier. So there's those things that are very tangible and sometimes easy to fix, and there's the intangible things, which is kind of cultural. And through the NASA Ambassador Program, we've been able to reach a lot of these communities, and that's why I think it's so important. As I mentioned earlier, there's been a plethora of people who have been absolutely instrumental in helping me get here and achieving my dream, and the NASA Ambassador Program allows us to be that avenue for these students. So, my, as I mentioned, my first internship was with NASA Land Research Center. Um, it was with Aerogels, which is a lowest density solid, and we used it for radiation for hypersonics. And Dr. Fran Hurwitz is one of those people. She is. She took me in, and she believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. Together, we published two papers, and she's the one that nominated me for the Student Ambassador Program. Since then, um, we have done a lot of different things. We've done things such as TEDx at NASA, we've done the NASA Day of Education, NASA Awareness Days, and these are some of the pictures. So uh, we had the Nuestro Futuro 2011 Latin Education Conference, um, and that was really great. That was in Washington, D.C. We had another student ambassador and a NASA Month student there as well. Then we actually went back to Miami, where I got my undergrad for NASA Awareness Day, and as you can see, we got lots of palm trees there. It's a beautiful campus, right in the heart of Miami. 
Um, and so then we have some other students there that also came in and talked about NASA and internships and other opportunities that they can have. Then this is actually something really cool, which I thought was a unique platform in trying to reach minority students. Um, this is the MICI, which is the NASA Minority Innovation Challenge Institute. And unlike some of the other outreach events, it did not require me to travel anywhere. And as you can see, I did that from my laptop in my apartment in Virginia. And the cool thing about this was, I was able to Skype into different classrooms, and they were able to ask me questions. So I had my presentation, it, it was live the whole time. Then I had that little box at the bottom that you could see right there. And somebody would raise a hand and ask me a question. And I would read it and I would respond to all of them. Moreover, it was actually recorded and it had a link with my email address. So if for whatever reason the students could not participate in the live discussion, they can watch the recordings and email me after if they have any questions. And I thought that was a really unique way of trying to reach and spread our, this, all our experiences with other people. This, I thought, was one of the most powerful things that we've done, or at least that I've done in terms of outreach through the Ambassador Program. Um, as Lila and Melvin, we partner with Univision through the Space Act Agreement. Um, now, that is Dra. Isabela. She has been, she's like the host of the radio angel. Um, I actually don't watch Univision, so I had no idea when I told my mom that they're going to be interviewing me for a radio show, and she's like, well, who is it? And I was like, Dra. Isabela or something like that? And she was going to backhand me. She's like, what do you mean you don't know who she is? She's huge. So as you can tell, she's a leading Hispanic radio psychologist. Um, she gets about 8,000 telephone calls attempts per day. And she's ranked in the top 15 Hispanic markets across the United States. And she's played in over 80% of the Latino households nationwide. And this was a one hour long interview in Spanish <laughs> talking about uh, NASA internships. So I actually have like a one minute clip if you guys want to hear it. It is in Spanish, but you'll be able to make out a few words like intern.nasa.gov. That's in English. And <laughs> there's a embajadora, which means ambassador, NASA, so NASA. Um, but if you can go ahead and roll it, it's like, it's like 60 seconds or something. <laughs> Esta se presenta hoy aquí la NASA por medio de Denise Aramón. Y no se creen que Denise es una estudiantita. No, ella es un ingeniero de investigaciones en NASA Langley Research Center en Hampton, Virginia. Ella está haciendo y cortando los cursos. Yeah, the sound quality can't really hear that well for the speakers, but it's really funny. So they spent the first half um, just in ta talking about OSSI and how to apply, and, and then the second half was having callers call in with questions. And that was absolutely terrifying because I had like all my prepared answers, and then I got a lot of questions that I wasn't anticipating, <laughs> and it was in Spanish, but it was great. So um, they actually asked to come back, and the next one would be Univision Despierta America, which is Wake Up America. And that's an even broader audience, so that's going to be really great to get those people, and that's nationwide as well. Okay, so then one of the things that I, that I want to mention, just to kind of go back to what I said initially, I feel like everybody here is pretty successful in their own right, and I think we almost have a moral obligation to help those who may need it, because as much as we want to think that the opportunities are equal, they're really not. And especially if you have a certain gift, like I have a certain understanding of that community it is my moral obligation to make sure that they can get, come back. And I think everybody shares that philosophy. So, it, you know, we can talk about all the ways that we can reach them, and sometimes all it takes is one person. And with the NASA ambassadors, you have over 300 of us in almost all 50 states. And if you can just use this, we can reach those people, and our reach can go even further. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ethan Brewer, and he is a senior undergraduate student in aeronautical and astronautical engineering at Ohio State. He's had internships at both NASA Glenn and NASA Langley. Hey everyone, so uh, I'm hoping this comes off as relaxed rather than uh, nervous, because I am. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name's Ethan Brewer, I'm senior in aerospace engineering at Ohio State. Um, so I made my presentation. Actually, it is rocket science. I think that's just one of the coolest things about being a rocket scientist is to get to tell people that you're a rocket scientist. And just you know, maybe maybe it doesn't go so far in this crowd, but uh, around you know, people just light up in awe. It's even you know, 
more amazing sometimes than when they ask how tall I am. Six foot six, by the way. Um, and then I also included this uh, quotation on here. My wings are a thousand books. I think that just speaks volumes about uh, how important education is. Um, Gil Rob Wilson was a big advocate of aerospace um, a long time ago, and our, uh, my aerospace class actually made some t-shirts at OSU and put this quote, quotation on the back. So um, I kind of come from a, the opposite end of the spectrum is uh, Denise. I come from a small town near Cleveland. Uh, my high school had 800 students. Um, it's a predominantly white school, really a great school system. Uh, so I grew up, you know, just minutes literally from NASA Glenn Research Center. I went, would go past it all the time. Uh, so I, I knew about NASA from an early age, and that was really uh, instrumental in influence, influencing me to go into aerospace. Uh, so in addition, I'll admit I'm a big fan of Star Wars, uh, and I'd be lying if I said that didn't have some influence on uh, my career choice. And, uh, also, when I was young, my parents took me several times to the uh, Cleveland Air Show, and it was just amazing to get to walk up close, go in, around uh, these airplanes, seeing them fly over. Uh, apparently, when I was young, um, as the airplanes were coming by, my parents said I used to run and scream as they went over and dove to the ground as they flew overhead, and uh, so I guess I uh, you know, had a love from airplanes from a very early age. Um, I also had some great uh, role models to look up to. My father, he's an engineer, in Cleveland. He does uh, civil engineering, but he still was a big influence in, to me uh, to, be, to go through engineering. And also, I have an uncle who uh, used to work at Glenn in a research center. He's now actually a branch manager at NASA Langley. So he was a big help in inspiring me and also helped me a lot in getting my internships. So uh, naturally, my first internship was at NASA Glenn Research Center, and I guess the whole title didn't show up there. It was the uh, LURSIF program, the Lewis Educational and Cooperative, I oh, know, sorry, Lewis Educational and Research Collaborative Internship Program. Uh, my specific project, I was working on the uh, Sterling Advanced Radio Isotope Generator. It's a power system for satellites uh, or space bases or lunar rovers intended to be much more efficient than the current generators. Um, you can see we were, we were doing creep testing on a heater head, which is this glowing red hot article you see right there. Uh, that actually helped conduct the heat from the radioisotope source into the generator. Uh, and it's high pressurized, high temperature, so it may be surprising that a metal will actually balloon outwards, you know, well, um, at such high temperatures and high pressures. And so we were monitoring that to make sure it didn't get too big. Um, there's the uh, generator right there, the full model. So what I actually did, and uh, that's kind of amazing in itself, because I know I've heard stories about people who've done internships, and they didn't really do anything. They spent the whole time you know, kind of looking over their intern's shoulder, or their mentor's shoulder. I actually got to go in and do things. They let me, they gave me the data and said, hey, we need a better way to analyze this data, because right now, we're getting these graphs that look like this, because we're using Excel, and we can't, uh, you know, do very good interpolation. We can't manage 200,000 data points in Excel. So I wrote a MATLAB code that can monitor these string data and give you a much higher resolution. You can see the uh, noise in the machine and also help edit that out to give you some you know, good results. And this just astounded my mentor. And I was kind of like, well, it's not just a MATLAB code. It's not that bad. But he was just so impressed with it. Um, and I also, on the other hand, I got to go into the lab. So I got both computer work and lab work. I was there helping collect data. Um, just, it was a really great experience, you know. Being able to sit down and say, hey, I think we could, you know, improve uh, this whole lab setup like this, and then have my mentor go, that looks great, let's do it. It's just really, really phenomenal to be able to do something like that. Uh, this is uh, these contact thermocouples we used. Um, because we found out that the test articles didn't like welded thermocouples, <coughs> tend to crack a little bit. So uh, my next summer, I spent at NASA Langley Research Center, um, kind of followed my uncle again. He said, hey, I'm going down here. You should try and get an internship, too. Uh, so it's nice to have a place to stay, um, being so far from home. So there, I was in the uh, advanced sensing and optical measurement branch, something pretty much completely different than anything I had known. Um, I went from doing engineering kind of stuff to this is more almost physics-based uh, 
infrared spectroscopy in on. Uh, something I'd almost, I'd pretty much never heard of before, but my mentor said, hey, we found this uh, system kind of sitting in the corner gathering dust. We think we could put it to use on some experiments. Uh, why don't you head up trying to get this thing going? So that's what I spent my summer doing. You can see the system here. We have a little this infrared light source and the sensor is here. Um, and they wanted to do that because they wanted, they were testing in an arc jet tunnel these uh, ablative heat shields like that you see on, we're on the Apollo capsules, on the Orion capsule, and on the Mars Science Laboratory capsule. And they wanted to see what exactly is it that's being burned off of these uh, heat shields. You know, they shield the vehicle by burning. So I got to working on this system. Uh, and we got some we got some good results in the in the lab test. We can see hey, there's H2O absorbing infrared light there and CO2. And uh, you know, uh, I thought this picture here was really appropriate given that we're supposed to be talking about how cool this is. Uh, there's me pouring liquid nitrogen into my detector, and it doesn't get much cooler than liquid nitrogen. Um, which was really great, especially given the rich in the heat that's on that. So, um, unfortunately, we weren't able, I wasn't able to see them put this into use, but it was just, again, a really great experience working with some incredible people at NASA Lane. So, uh, again, just I've met some amazing people uh, through NASA, uh, both of my mentors and all the people I've met, just incredible people, uh, great contacts. I still send them emails, uh, check out how they're doing, and they check how I'm doing, and uh, it's really great. And in such a short presentation, I can't talk about everything I've done, because in addition to my main projects, you know, you're going, getting to see tours, you can see all the NASA facilities, the wind tunnels, the other test cells. Uh, at Langley, I had the chance to go and to a group of uh, I think it was first to second graders. Um, we're doing a summer science uh, camp. We got to go to the high school and just talk to them for a while. And it was just so great to see such young kids getting really inspired, and really interested and inspired in uh, to go into STEM fields. Um, they asked some really great questions and sometimes some really interesting questions too. Uh, I'm trying to think of any. Uh, I can't think of any at the moment, but that was. Uh, it was a lot of fun just being able to have an impact on people as well as them have an impact on me. Um, it's just been some really great experiences. So uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up before I start to ramble even more. And uh, so. Thank you, Ethan. Our next speaker is Ivy Crystal Jones, and she is a doctoral student at Hampton University and she is studying solid state laser crystal material development. Ivy? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Ivy Crystal Jones. Um, this is just my title slide. This is a brief informal, informal introduction. I believe in God, I'm a woman of color, native of Chicago. I'm an only child, Virgo, love music. My favorite color is red, and my favorite food is Mexican. My academic history is just briefly, um, I started at TU, you know, Tuskegee University of BS in Chemistry, and then I went back home. I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor, so I got a master's in um, biotechnology, but it's, well, that's not my thing. Um, Tuskegee University, I went back and studied um, nanocomposites, which is um, related to a little bit of my NASA research. Um, and now I'm at Hampton, where I got my master's in physics, and I'm continuing on with my PhD in physics. Um, I'm just gonna briefly go over all my NASA activities. Um, here I am at the um, Goddard Space Flight Center in their number 100 clean room. Um, from fall 2004 to 2006, I was a space grant. Um, summer 2005, I got this cool opportunity to go to Marshall Space Flight Center, and um, they said they had a bug problem on their International Space Center, so they got a group of us together and we competed, it was fun. Um, that was the microbes in space, and that led to my gravitational wave summer school where they still haven't found any, but I love it, it's cool research. Um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, this is where I actually started to move away from being wanting to be a medical doctor. Um, and I decided to go to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory because they were studying, studying planetary evolution and how the planets you can study ice um, formations on certain planet surfaces, and that can tell you how maybe we, we came to be as humans in the Earth. 
Then I went to the annual planetary summer school, and by that time I was a mechanical engineer, so I was able to work with the configuration guys at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And on one end, we were the students, and there was a glass panel, and there were the real people, and that was super cool. And 2009, I went to Colorado Boulder for heliophysics that had to do with my optics solar kind of research. And um, May, March 2009, we actually wrote a paper on my actual experience at the summer school, um, the Planetary Summer School at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And this summer, I was able, I had the special opportunity to work at Dyer Space Flight Center, where we're going to everything in microtechnology. So, of course, you guys know weight and cost and mass is, is, is really important to NASA and all their exploration. So I'm, I've started this summer to work on a lot of their technologies that they're going towards the microchip. They want to downsize everything and actually put a whole HPLC gas mass on actually a microchip. So that's what I was doing this summer. Super cool. And uh, my, my best NASA-related research wasn't at NASA. It was actually at the Air Force Research Lab where I actually worked on a nanoparticle called POS. And actually in 2005, Bush, Yes, Bush. He actually designated POS to be a technology strategic interest for the United States. It's the first nanoparticle that, um, that the United States president has placed as a national strategic interest. Um, my dissertation research now is, um, the, of course, the development and spectroscopic studies of rare earth ion developed um, solid state materials. We can use solid state materials to make from the laser pointer that I'm using here to basically infrared all type of laser applications. Um, my spectroscopic studies are basic um, from transmission to absorption emission, photoluminescence, both room and light temperature measurements. And the applications vary from optical communications to atmospheric remote sensing. And especially specifically for NASA, they have a program called LIDAR. And if you guys know that the laser that they shoot up in the, scare, in the, um, the sky or atmosphere to detect the constituents that they're looking for, it's not eyesight. So when they have their radar in the laser detects an aircraft approaching or some other type of aircraft, not necessarily a plane. But they have to shut down, and that is research that is being lost while those airplanes are traveling over to get those measurements. So with my research, I'm going to be using what you call eyesight materials. So I'm going to be using lasers that are already, we already have these capabilities now, but they're not actually eyesight. So that's what I'm trying to push in my research at Hampton University. And a heartfelt thank you. And I just wanted to briefly show you a couple of cool pictures from my Goddard Space Flight Center. That's a statue at the God, um, at Goddard Space Flight Center of the, the bus of um, Dr. Goddard. And I actually had a center tour of the whole center, but this was my coolest stop, was to see the assembly of the James Webb Telescope. Um, then I got an actual oral presentation from a, no, um, a Nobel Prize winner, which is Dr. John Mavis, Senior Project Scientist. That was pretty cool. And I, they also have business parts at Goddard Space Flight Center, and they have what you call the Maryland Space Business Roundtable Luncheon, and that's where they get a, a bunch of interns selected together, and you actually are paired up with aerospace companies, not all aerospace companies, but the majority of them aerospace companies, and you're able to get contacts, and you're to able to take those contacts forward and use it, so it's not just, um, academia and government, you can also use industry to get involved as well in this, like as we've been seeing. And Goddard Day was so cool because I was actually able to get into one of the actual Humvees that they use now, and that 50 pound vest is what the soldiers have to go through, so I just wanted to see how it is to actually feel like I'm doing something. but. That's my talk. I'm my Crystal Jones. If you have any questions at the end, I'll be, you know, a baby. Thank you, Ivy. Our next speaker is Marcia Cole, and she received her bachelor's in chemistry from Grambling State University, and she's now pursuing her doctoral degree in chemistry from Louisiana State University, and she is also a Harriet Jenkins Fellow. No, I'm from the South, I'm from Dallas, Texas, so you know, this is going 
be a very warm type of speech. So you guys can relax a little bit. I don't want you guys to make me nervous, but be too stiff for So what I want to do is talk to you guys about my journey. And I know at NASA it's very cliche to have aliens on your presentation, but as a NASA student ambassador and being from where I'm from, I think it's almost appropriate because I felt like I was abducted at a young age. And so this is me when I was three. Um, and I felt like I was being abducted by aliens because I was very precocious as a young child. I knew far beyond my age. I, I, my parents didn't keep anything from me and my brother. We um, were always familiar with what our, our circumstances were. And so you can see there's a picture of my brother uh, pushing me towards some pigs, actually. I was really scared. But I felt like this probably got my face really well on how I was feeling. But they had to bring me back when I was five so I could start kindergarten. And this is the journey of how I became the almost PhD scientist today. And I say almost because in May 2012, by the grace of God, I will have a PhD doc after my name. So um, I come from Dallas, Texas, as I said before. And what I want to do is kind of bring you on my journey because there are a lot of students that come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds that use their circumstances as reasons as to why they cannot become scientists or why they cannot major in STEM or whatever reason that they use as a crutch. But in my case, it actually motivated me. I, I persevered through all of those uh, circumstances and triumphs. So you can see that in 18 years, being K through 12, I lived in five apartments, four houses, two motels. And even though I lived in those different places, I did grow up with both of my parents. And so even having both of my parents in the household made me significantly different than the other people in the neighborhood because they usually only had one parent in their home. And so um, you can see that this is one apartment complex that I lived in, Garland, Texas, where it's actually a dim now, it's got a fence around it. But this is even one house that I lived in. But through the economical uh, cycle of the United States, my parents have become victims to that, and we live in a variety of different places. And as a result of living in these different places, I've had um, gone to a variety of different schools. Mainly when I was in elementary school, I attended five different elementary schools. Most people say that's why their grades are bad, that's why they attend an excel in school. But my parents were not taking any excuses. I also had a hand in my uh, growth, so um, I made sure I always made good grades. And I was um, I attended two middle schools only because I was invited to attend um, another middle school in the seventh grade called Jackson Technology Center. It's formerly known as Jackson Middle School. And I was the first out of um, uh, several invited students to go through the entire program through a math science technology training type of program. And that program took us directly from the middle school to the high school, which is North Garland High School, also known as North Garland Math Science Technology High School. And you can see that the uh, statistics of both of these um, schools predominantly are economically disadvantaged, as well as predominantly are minority. There are more Hispanics and African Americans that were at the middle school that I attended in comparison to the high school that I attended. But overall, everyone pretty much did not have the most, econo most uh, best economical um, situation. So I graduated early from high school in three and a half years, but I still marched with my class, and I attended Grambling State University. Even though I was prepared to attend the leading schools in Texas, I graduated top 10% of my class out of 589 students. And I felt like I was still going to be attending school at University of Texas with the other 1 through 12 students that had a four point dot, 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 dot GPA that I didn't have. So I was very intimidated. So I was working at a physical therapy office, and there was a coworker that suggested I stop working, even though I was making $11 an hour and I thought I was rich. But they said, you know, why don't you leave here and go get you an education, you can make some real money. And he suggested I apply to Grambling State University, and that's what I did. So while I was at Grambling, I had a lot of great mentors, namely Dr. David Hubbard, who introduced me to NASA research my freshman year. I didn't have a lot of funding going to uh, Grambling, which is a historically black college and university. But when I went into the chemistry department there, I told Dr. Hubbard I wanted to be a pharmacist. He said, we don't have a pharmacy program. I said, why am I here? And he said, well, I think you can major in chemistry. And I said, I didn't do well in chemistry when I was in high school, so I don't think we should be speaking anymore. But he said, well, let me you know, give you another chance. Why don't you come through here? Let's see what you have. I'll invest in you. If you do well, I'll make sure you graduate with a degree in something. So I went to the chemistry department. He kept his promise. He introduced me to NASA research, which was in collaboration with the John Glenn Center. I did a project on polymerizable monomer reactors, preparation of novel polyamides, 
And at that moment, I had an exceeding abundance of encouragement and um, something that propelled me to continue on to STEM research and education. And a lot of mentors, Dr. Robert Lockhead, Dr. Sherry King Gissels, Dr. Michelle Hines, were all instrumental in uh, teaching me various opportunities uh, via different research experiences for undergraduates. So I also am representing them today. And then I went to Louisiana State University, which is where I'm at now. And this is my research advisor, Dr. Isaiah Warner. And while at LSU, I've had the opportunity to uh, receive a NASA United Negro College Fund Special Programs Fellowship uh, titled the Harry Jenkins Predoctoral Fellowship. And through that fellowship, I've been able to fund my graduate career as well as be able to do hands-on experience at one of the NASA facilities. I went to, went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and worked under Dr. Adrian Ponce, who's actually here today, and it's a surprise, I didn't know he was gonna be here. But um, when I was there, I'll show you the research that I did um, there, but one of the things that was very interesting to me is I actually got to meet the namesake of the fellowship that I had. And this is Dr. Harriet Jenkins, and, um, and, and I'm also standing with some of the other cohort members that um, came in with me that year. But while I had the Harriet Jenkins Fellowship, my other research experiences, as well as being at LSU getting my PhD, I've been able to hone my research interest into something that I thought probably would never happen because there's so many ways I can apply chemistry and I'm a very curious person. But because of my research, I've been able to do that. So the question was, how did I tie my dissertation research with the research at NASA? Because most people believe that the research at NASA all has to do with space and looking for aliens and rocks and things like that, but actually the research at NASA is even applicable to our everyday lives without, you know, it's just not exactly advertised that way. So my research at LSU is looking at antibiotics and antiseptics and changing them into these things we call gumbos in Louisiana, which stands for groups of uniform materials based on organic salts. These gumbos are a new modern approach to combination drug therapy. So the overall idea is preventing um, infection uh, transmission, maintaining for infection control, keeping sterility, and all of those things. When I found out that NASA has the mission for planetary protection, that's when I was like, aha, that's where my research can fit in. And that's what I did with Dr. Adrian Pont. And there I studied an inhibitory uh, response using various amino acids, which basically, if you think of a spore as an armadillo, when armadillos are in their ball, they're very indestructible. But when they open is when you can kill them. So there are some bacteria, mostly from Clostridium and Bacillus species, that they try to psych you out when you try to kill them. They go in this little ball. And then when you get done trying to kill them, you know, and they think the coast is clear, and they open back up, and then there's like, I'm still here. So in Dr. Ponce's lab, they've come up with this way of identifying the presence of spores. And I looked at some um, chemicals that can inhibit that process of them going into their spore or opening back up so that we can kill them using some spectroscopy as well as um, some microscopy. And so this, these opportunities that NASA have, has afforded me has allowed me to speak on a variety of different platforms. I've spoken at the NASA Ames uh, conference that was held in conjunction with the United Negro College Fund Special Programs this summer, as well as the Nova Shea conference. I presented the poster at NASA Ames as well as my research I did at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I've traveled across the United States, which I probably wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't received the investment and the support of many others. And then I was a student ambassador. So this is one of the most notable firsts in my family. I'm the first in my family to attend college, to graduate from college, to go to grad school, to get a PhD, to almost get a PhD in chemistry, to do all these things. And then I'm the only one in my family to be a NASA student ambassador. And I probably will have that title for a while. So this is me on a very happy day when I found out that I was a student ambassador for NASA. And this is what I received in the mail. I got this nice plaque as well as a picture of Dr. Milton of an astronaut and a badge that I'm wearing today. And then I got a nice um, award at the conference this summer with me. And so what is my take home message? Me being from the inner city, I represent a variety of different people. What do I want to share that NASA has done for me? Well, my whole life, the platform has put the stereo on mute. And what are stereo? What are, what are mute? What am I talking about? Well, stereo refers to stereotypes and statistics. If you mute those stereotypes and statistics, 
And how would you mute that? And that would be by the acronym, Maintaining and Understanding Through Teaching and Education, which is everything that you guys have been uh, emphasizing today. And what I want to do is let you guys know that I'm doing exactly the same thing through volunteer efforts. I make sure I participate in chemical demonstrations with the young K-12 students. I participate in the Sally Ride Foundation. I try to use myself as an exhibit to show other students that think they can that they can. And in doing so, I try to help cultivate talent in mentorless pools. I didn't really know much about NASA growing up in Dallas. But because of the people that have been placed in my life, I've been exposed to NASA. So if I can reach those other innocent people and the, just the common people that I see that I actually really don't even speak to, but I have a badge on, now they're more familiar with someone that's at NASA that they can help uh, probably identify with. As well as encourage these inner city youth to be bold beyond the expected. Too much in the inner city are people trying to get what we call at home, hood rich. And the hood rich means that you're too focused on trying to get drafted into the NFL, you want to get an NBA contract, you're trying to win the Powerball, you're trying to do everything that does not too much require your mental capacity. But mostly because people are not encouraged to exercise their mental potential. And um, I want to make sure that I extend that opportunity by showing, yes, I'm a product of the same environment, I've had the same circumstances, and even some that I'm not even mentioned, but it does not mean that you're not capable of going beyond what is expected. At the same time, I want to be a host reflection. If I reflect someone that you've seen before, you, I look like you, so why don't you think that you could achieve the same things that I've achieved? As well as, I want to minimize that bridge between the disadvantaged and the advantaged, which is called the achievement gap, that the White House likes to call it. If we could minimize that, then there would be no more segregated thought process about, well, I'm from a disadvantaged background, so I can't do that. that that's far beyond my, my reach. Everything is tangible at this point. But if you can establish educational legacies, then everything would be possible. So now I'm not only a legacy for my family, I'm a legacy for the, my future family, for the students that I may teach one day, as well as pass by on the street. I'm a legacy now, and if we can multiply that, which we have with the different student ambassadors here, then the whole NASA objective would be much more effective. And so I conclude by just showing my family, it has been us for my entire life. And we've all had a winding road, even though everybody likes to have hope and desire for a, a road that's straight and narrow. But we've had some curves in our road. And at the end of the day, my brother, who's now serving in Afghanistan, he will soon be home. And my parents were all hoping and sticking together. But I wanted to close with a quote that my father has always beat up in us um, my whole life, um, not even having a college degree himself, but he always has a lot of wise words. And that is, the only security in life is the one that you create for yourself. So when someone wants to invest in your future, you make sure it'll never come back void. And that's what I'm gonna leave here with you all today and let you know that your investments are not coming back void. And that all of us as student ambassadors, the fellows, the interns, the K through 12 students that each one of you guys reach out to, we recognize and we appreciate it. Because without you, there may not be one of us. So I close and thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. Thank you, Marsha. We have one more student ambassador, Cody Ensley who wanted to be here today, and unfortunately the winter weather kept his plane from, from taking off. Um, but he is a senior um, undergraduate student in computer engineering at Salish Kootenay College, and um, he's completed two internships at Johnson Space Center, and we actually have a video um, that details some of his internship experience that we'd like to play in place of him being able to give a presentation. Johnson Space Center in May of 2010, and uh, immediately I went to work in ER4, which is the robotics part of Johnson Space Center. One of my first projects was the wire that goes from the tip of the finger all the way back, and uh, right over this knuckle here, the wire can bunch when the finger's flat. It's actually kind of curved out here, but over time that can wear. And we wanted to make the hand more robust, so we had to fix that. Now that I come back for the second semester, what's really exciting is the work that I did on the hardware the first time, now I get to interact with from the software side the second time around. 
the graphical user interface that we built to control the robot um, allows me to work on the hands, and uh, so it's kind of interesting to see the, the same problem from different points of view. Cody is the kind of student that really takes on whatever task is given to him, looks at it, accomplishes what needs to be done, and then goes above and beyond. That kind of drive, enthusiasm, and energy that's behind it is it's contagious. The big area for improvement is the thumb. If you look at your hand, the thumb actually deforms when you go to touch your pinky. Um, this part of your hand does. And Robert doesn't do that right now. So he can touch here, he can touch here, and he can touch here. And that's one of the next improvements, probably, for the future of Robonaut. There's nothing about Robonaut that's not a 10-step uh, plan. Uh, the first step was building the robot, and then testing the robot. We wanted to see if we could do it, and now that we've proven that, we want to see how it performs in space-like environments. We sent him up to the ISS recently, uh, the National Space Station, and uh, I got to go down to Florida and see the shuttle launch with Robonaut on it, which was pretty amazing experience, not only to see the shuttle launch, but to know that the robot that you worked on is on there, and then you're going to see it with the entire team. I also got to go to Mission Control when the astronauts went to unbox the robot. Now we're going to spend some time testing him on the space station, see how he performs in space-like environment so that we can upgrade him so that he'll become a full-time astronaut assistant. And then eventually we'd like to see how he performs on other planets or something like the moon or an asteroid or onto Mars. I'm a descendant of the Confederate Salish Kootenai Tribes of the Flathead Indian Reservation of Pablo, Montana. It's a small town, less than 5,000 people. I was born and raised on the reservation, and I went to Salish Kootenai College, which is a tribal college built for tribal students by the tribal elders. So anything that I do or anywhere that I go, I'll make in contact with him and see if not only we can involve students on anything that I'm working on, but if I can come and teach at the college or give guest lectures or anything. I had always said, oh, after I graduate, I'm going to do a PhD, but I really didn't have a concept of what that meant. What I found out is that a PhD is research-based, and that's exactly what I want to do now. What I've found coming from the reservation is that my point of view is different from some other engineers, mostly because they seem to look at systems from an organic point of view. I look at the base building blocks, and I see how they're going to grow together. I seem to have a pretty good grasp of how this system over here and this system over here are eventually going to relate to each other. They've taken advantage of that in a couple of situations, and it's been pretty rewarding to see how somebody at the age of 23 can offer something to these engineers that have been doing this for, you know, 25, 30 years. I think Cody had all the tools he needed when he came in. He just didn't know that and didn't really know how to apply it. And since he's been here, he's shown a lot of growth in his capabilities and his confidence. And that's probably the biggest thing I've seen is his, his confidence has matured significantly. When you're on the reservation, it's easy to stay on the reservation and not look beyond your doorstep. And when an opportunity like this falls in your lap and you latch onto it, and you hold onto it very tightly and it takes you places you couldn't imagine and you see things and you work on things that you didn't even know existed. Um, and people want your point of view. How can you not you know, come back home and say, look, look at these opportunities out here. Look at all these things that are, that are right here. You just have to take that step and latch onto them. Cody's really shown that this can be just the key experience that motivates students to just bear down in the degree program, do the best they can, and set some high career goals and go on and meet them. NASA is a challenge, but when you step back and look at it all and say, wow, look, I did this, and in the end it was worth it. I got to see a robot that I work in go to space. It's easier to go to other students to say, there are opportunities like this, they may be difficult, but you will get through them, and in the end it is so worthwhile, it is so worth every step you took to get here, because you look back at all this work that you've done, and you're, you're less than a quarter of a century old, and you can say, look at all these things that I've done, look, scientists are going to use these, or, you know, this, this robot is in space right now, and I did that. I feel like I've made a contribution, and that, that's pretty amazing. I pin the reason that I've become an engineer on my parents' investment in hundreds of dollars worth of Legos. 
over my lifetime. And from an early age, I was given a screwdriver, and I was allowed to take apart anything in the house without fear of a from my parents. Specifically, vacuum cleaners and toasters. We've gone through a lot of those. Thank you, everyone. I want to extend another thank you to our panelists. I think you'll all agree there's a, just an excellent group of student ambassadors. Can you give them another hand? as I do, and uh, thinking that working with NASA in whatever capacity, industry, academia, or being one of our student ambassadors truly is a cool experience. So thank you again for what you've done and for the work that you're doing to inspire people coming up behind you. So thanks again for the work that you've done.